All right, we had to move out into the woods here because of the, the rain. And we're going to try to get this sermon done here outdoors. That's the joy of, uh, you know, preaching the word out here in nature. You know, uh, the Lord decides to water the, you know, the woods and the forest. Well, okay. But anyhow, Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In other words, he'd have to hold fast their profession of faith. Hold fast. Don't give it up. They have to endure to the end to be saved. Okay? Matthew 24, verses 42 through 51. Let's read that quick here. It says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, what's going on there? At the time, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, these Jews, the remnant of Jews that are left, that have fled into the mountains when they see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy, holy place, flee. They're supposed to get out of Jerusalem. Okay, now in that time period, when they see that and, they, and they're out there, it's going to start getting kind of rough. The food's going to start to run out, you know, and other things are going to start to get bad. And they're going to start to get real tempted to go back into town, you know, to back into Egypt there, which I just said Egypt, meaning Jerusalem, but it's interesting because Jerusalem is actually called Sodom and Egypt in that time. See, the Jews have made an exodus out of Egypt, and in the future the Jews are going to have to make an exodus out of Jerusalem. Very interesting. But when they see that and they're out there, they're going to be real tempted to go back to Jerusalem and take the mark. And what these guys are going to have to do is they're actually going to have to be encouraging one another, hey, we have to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. He's coming. Jesus is coming. Don't give up hope. We have to stay out here. Jesus will be coming very soon. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know what the month is. See? They will know the month. All right? And they will know the year. They won't know the day or the hour, but they will know the, the month and the year. And so they're going to be saying, you know, they'll have to exhort one another. See? Don't want to get ahead of myself. But um, if you go to Matthew 25, and again, we're not going to read it for sake of time, but Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, you have a parable of the kingdom of heaven, which is the millennial kingdom. That's not where God dwells. The millennial kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, you can read there in Matthew 11 where it talks about, you know, the kingdom of heaven uh, that, you know, suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Okay, it's the earthly kingdom headquartered in Jerusalem. That's what's going on there. But that parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins, it's talking about people that are holding fast their profession of faith. They are enduring to the end to be saved. That's what's going on there. It's a parable of the Jewish people at the end of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble there, at the end of that thing, as they're waiting to go into the millennial kingdom. Okay. You can read these verses on your own. Like I said, I can't, we can't do that right now. And then if you go to Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, you have the parable of the servants, and they're given talents and things, and they're supposed to do something with these talents. And, you know, two of them do, the third one does not. And that man is actually taken and thrown into hell because he didn't do anything with his talent. And you say, what's that have to do with the... Jews at the remnant of the Jews at the time of the end of the J time of Jacob's trouble. Well, if you have saved Jews in Jerusalem and they're living there and they're not taking the mark and things and they're not part of it and whatever else, and they have to flee into the mountains towards the middle of that time period and they've run out into the mountains, you might have 
save Jews that are doctors. This guy over here is a knows how to hunt. This guy here knows how to fish. This guy here knows how to make bread, you know, make fire and whatever else. You're going to have talents that are going to be necessary to survive. And those Jewish, that Jewish remnant, I believe that the Lord is specifically going to have certain people chosen that are going to go out there and they're going to have to use their talents to help their brethren hold fast the profession of their faith. They're going to have to use those talents to endure to the end of that thing without giving up and going back to Jerusalem to join with the Antichrist and be damned. Okay? And you say, well, what happens if they don't? Well, then they'll be like the, the bad servants there in Matthew 24 that begin to smite their fellow servants and they go and eat with the drunken. See? They go back to Jerusalem. That's what's going on there. Okay? Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. We're not going to read all these verses here, but when the Son of Man... Verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Okay? And then He goes on to say, you know, He basically judges them. He judges the sheep first, and then He says, Go into the kingdom. And then He judges the goats, and He says, Go into the hell there, into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, but look at uh, verse 35 and 36 here. He says, For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. And they said, you know, then they go on, they say, Well, when did we see you, or when did we feed you, or, you know, whatever. And Jesus says in um, verse 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Okay? I apologize, by the way, too, for the construction that's going on over that way. You know, I'm sure you can hear that. It's annoying, but uh, we're almost done here. But you see there, this thing of works being very necessary there. Why? Because they have to endure to the end. They can't just say, I believe by faith and no matter what happens, no matter what I do, I can't lose my salvation because I'm sealed under the day of redemption. No, that's for a Christian. No matter what you do, if you are genuinely saved, you can really mess up your life and still go to heaven. Now, you won't have any rewards and you won't get any inheritance in the millennial kingdom, but you're still saved. These people are not. These people must endure to the end to be saved. Okay? They have to hold fast the profession of their faith without wavering. Okay? Now remember these verses here in Matthew for Jews at the time of the end of the time of Jacob's trouble there. Remember those verses as we go back to Hebrews chapter 10. Okay? So turn back to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, and we'll read down through verse 39. Okay, it says here, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Compared to Matthew chapter 25, you see it? See how it all ties together? Verse 25, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Hmm. Get back to that in a minute. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Hmm. 
Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Huh. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Huh. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. All right. Verses 26 and 27 there. Or, well, let's talk about verse 24 first of all. Uh, the Jews will need to provoke each other unto good works. Like we talked about there in Matthew 25, verse 35 through 36, talks about feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, taking in strangers, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and in prison. Okay? And they have to do that so that they can enter into the millennial kingdom. All right? That element of works is there. They endure to the end to be saved. Okay? Verse 25, the time of Jacob's trouble, saints are going to need to meet together to encourage one another and so much the more as they see the day approaching. What is the day? The return of Jesus Christ. The second advent. That's the day that they see approaching. The day of the Lord is another way that you could say it. What is a day with the Lord? One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So what is the day of the Lord? The millennial kingdom. What starts the day? The second advent. Jesus Christ coming back, setting up his throne in Jerusalem and judging the nations. See? It all ties together. It totally ties together. But it does not tie together with a bunch of reprobates that have buildings that are not sanctioned in Scripture and putting Hebrews 10.25 onto a Christian that chooses not to be part of the building system doesn't tie together with that. Okay? Verse 26 and 27 talks about, you know, there, if they sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. What happens to the goats in Matthew 25 when they're judged? They're cast into the lake of fire. Hmm fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Huh. You think that ties together? Yeah. You see, what happens is, like I said, a Jew, in the time of Jacob's trouble, they get towards the end of that thing and they say, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. I can't take this. No food. I can't take being hunted like a criminal. I'm going back to Jerusalem. What did they do? They were saved, but they go back. They take the mark of the beast. They fall into perdition, you know, like the son of perdition, which you see later on there in the chapter. They go back to perdition, and they're damned. And once you take the mark, you can't get saved. You can't do it. Read Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. Any man that takes the mark is lost. You know? Just as plain and simple as that. Verses 28 through 29... Notice the Jewish reference to Moses' law in verse 28 and how it compares to, to no mercy on those who turn away from Jesus Christ. Huh. Again, what's, who's this pointed to? It's pointed to the Jews that understand Old Testament law. Very interesting. Verse 30. Okay, it says here about the vengeance belongeth unto me. You know, I bet you that the... Uh, Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, I bet you they're going to want to see vengeance done. Why? Probably because they'll get to see their families being beheaded and friends being beheaded, you know. And, you know, there's some theories that say that when the sacrifice and ab ablation is caused to be ceased by the Antichrist in the temple there, there's some people that actually speculate that the Antichrist might start to sacrifice the Jewish people instead, you know blood sacrificing of Jews. I bet you those Jews are going to want to take revenge on that Antichrist. 
And the Lord's just like, don't worry about it. I'm going to get him. And you can read about that in Revelation chapter 19. The Lord gets the Antichrist and his whole army. That's going to be a wonderful day. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, that's going to have to be the real motivation there in the back of the mind of these Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to have to remember it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I might fall into the hands of the Antichrist here, you know, if he comes out here, but I have to believe that Jesus is going to come back before the Antichrist gets us. And I'd rather fall into God's hands, you know, and be safe there than go and try to fall into the Antichrist's hands and expect him to keep me safe from Jesus Christ when he comes back. <laughs> you know, you got to keep in mind the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, and there's an angel that flies in the midst of heaven back in the book of Revelation preaching the everlasting gospel and he says, fear God. And it's an angel, by the way, not an eagle, like the NIV says. Okay, there are no flying, talking eagles. Okay, verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Right now, the Jews are not illuminated as a people. They are cast away, basically. They are, God has not, you know, is not done with them totally. You read Romans chapter 11. But they will be brought back but it's only after, you know, the Lord illuminates them. And how's he going to illuminate them? How's he going to show them that the New Testament is accurate? The book of Revelation, brethren. Seven years of signs and wonders. Seven trumpets. Seven uh, seals. Sorry, the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vile judgments. That's a lot of signs. Well, the Jews require a sign. Again, see how it all ties in? But they endure a great fight of afflictions after they understand that the New Testament is legitimate. And yet the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, coming back and preaching to them to further confirm the word. Pretty amazing. Verse 33. Okay, the people that do not receive the mark of the beast are going to be made a gazing stock, as it says there. You know, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. You know what's going to happen to those Jews? Kind of interesting, the word there, gazing stock. Kind of puts you in mind to grazing stock, you know. I mean, what do you see when you see animals that are grazing? You go past a field, a farm, and there's cattle out there grazing in the pasture. You know those Jews that don't take the mark of the beast in that time? They're going to be like that. They'll be the ones that are out there in the wilderness and these people in the city will be driving along and they'll say, what's that dirty old man doing over there? A dirty couple over there. Look at, look at that, homeless or something. What are they? Oh, honey, they're those nuts that don't take the mark. Yeah. Is it going to be tough? Uh-huh. They're going to have to be out there in the fields trying to find some food. Maybe even at the garbage dumps trying to find food. Hmm. It's going to be kind of rough for some of the Jews that are worth a lot of money right now. And they'll get to that point in time where they realize the New Testament is legitimate. I can't take the mark of the beast. And they're going to lose everything. You say, prove it. Okay, let's continue. Verse 34. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You know when they become an enemy of the state in the future, they're going to have to watch the spoiling of their goods. They'll watch the troops come in, these Jews, and they say, I, I can't take the mark. Well, then you're an enemy of the state, and we're going to confiscate your house and your car and everything. And they'll see those soldiers coming in and spoiling their goods and their belongings. And now you have a rich, wealthy Jew, and he's like watching up on a hillside. as his, He's looking down at his house as the soldiers are walking out, laughing, you know, eating his food, wearing his clothes, driving his car out. You know, putting on his house property of homeland security. Hmm. Spoiling of your goods. They're going to watch the spoiling of their goods because they don't take the mark of the beast. Oh, but wait a second, though. The book of Hebrews chapter 10 is for Christians today that forsake the assembling of themselves. You see? Read the context of the chapter, brethren. It's not for Christians today. 
continuing here. Okay, verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Hold fast the profession of faith without wavering. Hmm. Endure to the end to be saved. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. You know those Jews that get to watch their houses being spoiled and all their goods being taken, their goods being spoiled? You know what they're going to get back? The whole world? If they endure to the end and they don't give up hope in Jesus Christ coming back as they see the day approaching, you know, they don't give it up, they're going to get to inherit the whole world. And they will be the most favored nation on the planet. Jesus Christ himself ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And then the Lord says, hey, you got to have all your stuff stolen? I'm going to give it back to you. Kind of like uh, Job in the Old Testament. Hmm. Did you know that Job is a type of a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble? And what do you have after Job? You have the return of the king in the book of Psalms. And after that, you have the wisdom of the king, Proverbs. Huh. Isn't it interesting? Okay, look at verses 36 through 39. For you have need of patience. You have to be patient waiting for the Lord. Yeah. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. What's the promise? The millennial kingdom. It's right there. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. You don't know the day or the hour, but you can know the month and the year. Jesus Christ is not going to tarry. Hmm. Not about that. Drop my notes. Verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Huh. The servant, the wicked servant, that begins to smite his fellow servants. The man that goes back to Jerusalem and joins with the Antichrist. The Lord has no, no pleasure in that man. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Uh, isn't the Antichrist called the son of perdition? Yeah. If a Jew in that time period draws back to perdition, to the Antichrist, God's not going to have any pleasure in somebody like that. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You know what salvation is going to be at that time period, brethren? Salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be enduring to the end to be saved. And at that point in time, they're not going to be able to forsake the assembling of themselves together. As the matter of some is, but exhorting one another. What, what for? Provoking each other unto good works. Hey, brother so-and-so, you lost your house. Your wife took off. She she wouldn't join you in this in this in your belief in Jesus Christ. You know, uh, sister so and so, you watched your husband and kids be killed. Brother over here, you you lost your whole business. Yeah, I did. You know, they're going to be talking about that. We must we must wait for Jesus Christ. We know the scriptures. The scriptures have been confirmed to us. Moses and Elijah were here for three and a half years. They were killed and they went back up to heaven. And told us to wait for the promise of his coming. Jesus is coming soon. And some guy over here goes, I don't think I can wait much longer. I, 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 I can't take it. I'm, go, I'm going to go back to Jerusalem. And what happens? He falls away. Okay? And he goes and he takes the mark. It's impossible to renew him again unto repentance. See how this stuff, it, it all lines up. And for these wicked, independent Baptists, because they're the ones that are doing most of it, or independent Bible, a lot of these people, they're throwing Hebrews 10.25, ripping it completely out of context, and throwing it against Christians who want to abide by the King James Bible and say, I don't see any calls for church buildings in here. I don't see any calls for having to go to this weekly sermon and remain in the congregation of the dead where I'm not being taught anything, where I'm not being fed. I want out. I want to worship the Lord Jesus on my own terms. I want to go out and have ministry. There again, I was part of a church building, Liberty Baptist Church. They said, 
we said we'd like to go down and track a Walmart, you know, put tracks and things. And you know what he said? He said, no. No, I don't want you doing that. And we said, well, we won't, we won't use tracks with the church's name on it. We'll just use unmarked tracks. He said, no. No, you're not going to do that. No. That's what the senior pastor said. Yeah. They're worried about their building. They're scared stiff that they're going to lose their building. And let me just give you a little bit of word of prophecy here. And I don't know whether this is going to happen before the rapture or not, but there's going to come a time very, very soon. The sodomite agenda is growing and growing and growing and getting bigger and more powerful all the time. And there's going to come a point in time when all church buildings, 501c3 or not, all of them are going to be told, you will not preach against sodomy. And if a sodomite comes to you to be married, you will perform the wedding. I'll guarantee it. Why would God continue something that he never sanctioned in his word? You show me one verse of scripture where God ever told anybody to build a building and call it a church in the New Testament. Don't try to duck it and go back to the Old Testament and say, well, Solomon built a temple. You know, yeah, and what did that temple turn into? Um, if this work of this council be of men, it will come to naught. Did the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's great, magnificent temple with all the gold and all the overlaid gold and all this other stuff, did it come to naught? Yes, absolutely. Why did Stephen say in Acts chapter 7, why did he say, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands? You know why he said that? Because he realized buildings that are called temples or houses of God or whatever else, they come to naught every single time. And the buildings right now in America, the buildings right now in the UK, in Australia, any other country, Germany, wherever, you know, France, Spain, wherever, all buildings are going to come to naught. And the only Christians that are going to survive this thing are the ones who know the book, who get out of these buildings and say, I'm going to learn, I'm going to study on my own because I can't learn in this allotted time of 9 to 12, 6 to 7, 7 to 8. Those Christians that are not content with two days a week to worship the Lord. Those Christians that say, I want that personal relationship with Jesus Christ that is seven days a week. I'm not content with two days to worship the Lord. I want it all the time. And they don't have to do it behind the doors of some building someplace. That the Antichrist is just about ready to take over. Okay? And that's the spirit of Antichrist, okay? I'm not saying that the Antichrist is manifested in the flesh yet. But what I'm saying is that spirit of Antichrist is going to take over soon. So if you are a house church Christian and somebody, some papist out there, tries some papist hireling, tries to pin you down and say you're disobeying Hebrews 10.25, don't let it bother you because they're lying. They're ripping that verse completely out of its context. They are the ones that are actually disobeying it. As I said earlier, nowhere in that, in Hebrews 10.25, does it say weekly service. Nowhere does it say building called a church. Nowhere does it say saved and lost coming together, bring in lost to get them saved. It says ourselves, not saved and lost. Okay? They are the ones that are guilty of Hebrews 10.25 of not following that verse. They're the ones that are guilty of it. Not you as a house church Christian. Okay? So, I'm going to be talking more about this thing. I, I'm going to be honest with you, brethren. I have been very, very gracious to people that are in church buildings in the past. And I know some of you out there are going to a building someplace. And, you know, you like it and everything else. But brethren, it's not of the Lord. It's not in the Bible. It's not in there. And what's going to happen is... Let me just say this yet, too. What's going to happen in the very near future, this wicked Antichrist system is going to start looking, and they're going to start looking at that real estate, and they're going to start saying, hmm. I forget, I had it in one of my older sermons, The Seven Reasons for a House Church. But church, you know, church real estate in America alone is up into the billions and billions of dollars. I forget the exact number, but it's billions of dollars. Now, do you think that... Uh, the corrupt men out there aren't going to look at that and say, I think I'm going to take that. See? 
they're going to come after it. And you think that these sodomites out there are not upset at the Christians preaching against sodomy? They are. And you know what they want? They want more than anything to silence anybody who preaches against sodomy. You know? Who are they going to go after? They're going to have to go, they're going to go after the church buildings. And these pastors are going to be told, you're going to preach this and you're going to preach that or we're going to shut the doors to your building. They've already done it here in America, brethren. Look at Pastor Greg Dixon. Told him. They went in there, said, we're going to shut your church down. They chained the doors and stuff, bulldozed the place in. It's already happened. And I'm sure that there are many more examples of places that I don't even know about. It's going to happen, brethren. It's going to happen more and more and more. And it's going to get to a point you're not going to be able to go to these places. I already have to tell brethren, you know, people that get saved, I say, Oh, you just got saved? Don't try to find a church building someplace. Why? Because they're so corrupt. They're so completely corrupt. You know what you need to do if you just got saved? Follow the Apostle Paul's example. Study the Word on your own. Take three years to study the Word. You know? Then maybe get in contact with some other brethren. You know? Imagine that. And then maybe after that, you take another 14 years to do more work for the Lord, you know, before going and talking to more brethren. You know, 17 years of laboring for the Lord. That'd get you some pretty good rewards in heaven, wouldn't it? But uh, 17 years of going and remaining in the congregation of the dead and being your, doing your part in the little pageant that goes on there, what's that going to get you? I can tell you what it got me. Zero. You know when the Lord called me into the ministry? It was when I got fed up with the church buildings and I left them. And instead of going to some dead building someplace and hearing a dead sermon, stuff that I've learned when I was a kid, instead of doing that, I actually started to study the Bible on my own. Hmm. But anyhow, I'm, I'm starting to rant now. So we'll close here with a word of prayer. It's starting to rain again, so... We better finish up here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for the right exposition, exp, exp, expository study there, exposition of it. I thank you, Lord, that uh, for showing me these things. And I just pray, Lord, that, that um, you would help the brethren out there to see that uh, they don't have to feel second rate if they don't have some building to go to, Lord. And uh, I just pray for those that are part of buildings, Lord, that they would start to think about what they're part of and that they would see the, the fact that these buildings are going to go the way of the Antichrist and probably not that far out into the future and that they would prepare themselves to, to pull out of those places and uh, just spend time with you, Lord, spend time with other believers, that they would learn to fellowship and not have to feel this, this thing of being a legitimate Christian because they're part of a building. I just pray, Heavenly Father, that, that uh, your people would begin to come out of that system. And for those that are out, that they would go out and, and witness and, and minister and lay up treasures in heaven, Lord, because time is short before you take us out of here. And uh, if this message survives into the time of Jacob's trouble, Lord, I pray that those Christians, those Jewish Christians that will be there, while well, Jewish saved Jews, I pray, Lord, that they would uh, hold fast the profession of their faith without wavering, but they would stay, stay the course and, and not give up hope in your return. And I just uh, pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know, I want to say one other thing here in closing, and that is, it's interesting, this whole thing of the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, they have to keep the faith that Jesus is going to come back as they see the day approaching, they're to exhort one another. And it's very interesting because we're actually seeing a mirrored image of this thing today in the body of Christ. Because we are waiting to see Jesus Christ in the clouds. Jesus is not going to come down and physically touch down on the earth as he will at the second coming. You know, and like you see there in Matthew 25, to set up his, his throne in Jerusalem to judge the nations. You know, that's not going to happen for us as Christians you know, that's for the people that go through the time of Jacob's trouble. 
But for us, we're looking for the catching away. We call it the rapture. And it's going to happen before the time of Jacob's trouble. Pre-tribulation rapture, you know. And a lot of people are starting to smite their fellow servants, smite their brethren and say, it's not going to happen before the tribulation. That's a lie. It was invented by John Nelson Darby in 1830. You know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. Watch my videos on that thing. Don't let anybody steal your, your hope, the blessed hope from you, that Jesus Christ is going to take his body out before the time of Jacob's trouble. Don't let anybody, you know, smite you and say, oh, it's not going to happen. All right, do, don't lose faith in Jesus Christ's return that's coming. Okay? So be encouraged. If you are part of a house church fellowship or if you just fellowship on your own, you know, and, and you fellowship with brethren online, through online forums and whatever else, don't feel second rate. You're not second rate. You are not disobeying Hebrews 10.25. Church buildings are disobeying Hebrews 10.25. So that's going to be it. It's raining pretty good here. So uh, we're going to close up here, and we'll see you next week. That's it. Thank you.